But I, I think about this and I found some stuff. I was like, okay, well, what does it take to be can't see the top one? But what would it take to solve this financially? And it's actually not a lot, right? We know that we're up in this corner. We're addicted to fuel. This is the big problem. We're addicted to energy. It's creating a mess. This has even changed. This was actually a pretty recent graphic. We're now over 400 parts per million of carbon in our atmosphere. And this is a column of what it would take to actually take us completely off the grid, right? So if you look at that and you say, all right, $7 trillion will take us geothermal, take us off the grid. $7 trillion sounds a lot of money. It's not really when you think we spend $1.7 trillion a year on defense spending to protect us from who? Each other. It's kind of nuts to protect us from each other when the thing that we should really be worrying about is how do we survive? So maybe we should cut our sort of defense spending in half and put a little you know, bucket aside. And within not many years, we'll actually be able to pay for a geothermal planet. And you can do the math, right? But the reality is we're in a nature emergency. We hear this the whole time. So the session and the panel that I'm trying to set up is all about advocacy. And I use this, which is the Kubros model for analyzing grief and suffering. And there's five stages. And I kind of think this is really appropriate for our discussions and the way we've been kind of engaging with the climate science. I've been doing this now, and I'm, I'm you know, beard and old, I'm 35 years old. I've been doing this since I'm 20. This is my 15th year doing this in this space. 15 years, and I, I hate to say it, I'm having the same conversations, and it sucks. I've become, I was an optimist, and now I'm, I'm, I'm an optimistic pessimist. And the reality is that we aren't moving to acceptance, and there's a reason for that, right? Well, some of us are still in denial, some are still angry, some are still bargaining, some of us are depressed about it. And unless you move through those stages and get to acceptance, we can't move to action. And we keep on jumping back and forth between those stages. I do it. Some days I'm super depressed about this stuff. And I'm like, and then I get angry. And then I go backwards and I hate myself for it. So I'm like, okay, come on, let's get on with it. And then I find an inspiring story that makes me engage. And I think that's where we're at, is that we have to get to acceptance if we want to actually start taking action. For me, a few things that have stopped us taking action, the first one is this, climate change. The phrase climate change always has this word debate tagged alongside it. It's not a debate. If you're debating it, you're a denier. Simple, you're on the wrong side of the fence. Get out, go away. You know, we've got an IPCC report coming out on Friday, and the only thing that the media wants to talk about is that there's a little dip in the amount of warming and the amount of carbon in our atmosphere and that big dip is suddenly going to make us all like, it's a hoax, climate gate again. It's like, shut up, get out. <laughs> Literally, if there's someone who wants to debate climate change, just leave now, right? It's not a debate anymore. It's so obviously not a debate. The second thing that's stopping us, I think, from acceptance is we've forgotten that we are from nature, right? That's us at the back having a lot of fun. And that's us here now. Are you serious with a stick? <laughs> right? And we externalize ourselves from the web of life. We are nature. Nature is us. One and the same. We are part of the web of life. Yet we commoditize nature without really looking at the true effects on us. We're one species. Millions of species every day are affected by us, our dominance. And because of that, because of our sort of externalization of nature, and I call it like, and I shouldn't say this in front of the CEO of the weather company, but it's like nature porn. Right? We get there with time. Oh, yeah, animals running. You know? <laughs> Whales diving, oh my god, the ocean's full of dolphins, right? <laughs> and then we turn it off, and then we go, and we don't realize there's some dude sitting in a, like a hut for like nine years, waiting <laughs> for that one scene of those few dolphins. <laughs> and yet we look at it and we're like, oh yeah, the ocean's awesome, you know, I can turn it on and off. So I call it like nature pornography, what we're doing with, you know, the other big nature channels, I've totally run out of time. The other thing that we suck at doing, Right? As, as environmentalists, what we really suck at is basically we're like the health industry. We tell you how to do things. That's, that, no one wants to hear that. Right? We totally tell people how to do things. I always go and say, don't eat cake, don't drive that car. Do more push-ups, change that light bulb. It's the same thing. We use guilt as the opening kind of narrative for how we engage people. We've been really bad at engaging. So advocacy and getting people engaged, getting governments to react, businesses to react, individual communities to stand up and take action has to be about inspiration. So how do we move forward? Buckminster Fuller said we need to do more or less. It sums up everything, right? Because we're obsessed by everything that goes up and we're not gonna stop consuming. So we have to think about the base back into nature. How do we do more or less? This is what you, 
really associate with people who are in the advocacy space, right, or, or what I call activists. These are the traditional things that they would do. Write emails. This is a sort of a photo. This is, I, I put in literally activist green, and this is what came up. Power station, please, screaming. It was probably taken from a Greenpeace rally. Um, and these are the traditional things. And these are the things that we've all done. We've all stood outside and we've championed conversations and we've done this and we're banging on the walls and we're hitting our things, we're writing our emails. And it's awesome, but it's failing. It's failing massively. And so not to just be the pessimistic bearded hippie on stage, what I want to say is that there is a new movement that's starting to like, change the way that we engage with these issues. And that's where I get excited. It's called Weapons of Mass Distribution. Activism 2.0 is unfolding amongst us today. Like eight years ago, there wasn't Facebook. 14 years ago, there wasn't even Google. I always wonder who was answering all those questions. <laughs> all of them. Sergey, like writing, he was in every library. Um, but you think about it, this has changed the landscape, and I'm well over time. Cut out, keep going, keep going. Okay. Go. <laughs> this is basically the landscape that has just occurred. And it's amazing, like every single day, there's something new, like the, the, sort of like the little ecosphere. So Instagram launches, and all of a sudden there's Printagram, and there's like Flickrgram, and all these ones that support this like infrastructure. And what's awesome about this is right now, something's happening in the world that sucks, right? And that's not awesome, but what's awesome is that someone is at home tweeting it, blogging it, talking about it. Someone else is capturing that information, is inspired, find a solution is sharing with the creative community. They then can walk over to the crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, crowd everything community and get stuff off the ground like never before. The democratization and the kind of leveling out of content is changing the field. It's totally changing the field. And this, for me, is where activism is going. It's going to the place where you and your bedroom can change the world. And every day I'm inspired when I read a story about a 17 year old who's figured out how to get plastic out of the ocean and that he's going to fund it through crowdsourcing, right? Like crowdfunding, Kickstarter. I get inspired by someone who's literally figuring out solutions on their mobile phone and it's happening, right? So the activists of old, which used to, if we go back one slide, um, it was like, rah, I hate you, stop it, right? It's totally not that anymore, right? Now they're going too far back. <laughs> One more. That is the activist of today. That is it. The future, the future, my friends, is there. Right? <laughs> you laugh, but it's true. Right? And what's also kind of awesome is the future is also here. With the innovation, the ability to make things. We can now tackle this through making stuff. And why is that important? Because right now, the only rallying call that we see is like, we're gonna spend our way out of this problem. We're gonna spend our way out of the, you know, this economic downturn. We've got a country that has an incredible amount of unemployment, incredible amount of disfranchisement. People are feeling depressed, no job, no future. What are they gonna do? Let's start making stuff. If you make it, you don't have to ship it in, cut down on your carbon emissions. If you make it, you create a little economy for yourself you can actually start doing it. And we started looking at what constitutes an innovator, the 10 habits, and this is some research I just finished. These are the habits that we came up with after interviewing everyone from the third ward here, the Brooklyn Yards, we went to D school at Stanford, we spent the last three months going around the world talking to the people who are making stuff. And this to me is the 10 habits, I would say, of, an, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, what I would call an actionist. I'm just trying to change the slide. Oh, hang on. Oh, oh. oh. It's up. So make no mistake, we hate sustainability. We hate that people don't even want to hear the word anymore. We hate that it has become a management decision that gets passed down like secondhand shoes. We're over it. We're here to unveil a new age of design. One that is about making better things and making things better. One that is built upon an insatiable curiosity and inexhaustible work ethic. One that gives the power back to the makers of things instead of makers of decisions. This is about better choices for better tomorrows. It's about opportunities, not obstacles. Options, not mandates. We're talking about transparency, not confusion. This is about potential to do things you never thought you could with things that you always had. It's about time the do-gooders took heed from the good doers. 
So consider this your rallying cry. Reclaim your rightful positions as catalysts of progress. Rise up against the pencil pushers with unworked hands and uncurious minds. Go to your drawing boards and draft tables and workstations. Prepare to design things that matter. Prepare to change the way the world makes things. Prepare to redesign the making of making. Makers of the world unite.